Thank you, Swanee. Um, I just had a filling lunch, and I tell you, I'm, I'm kind of tired. But, uh, and I've got a good reputation at the University of Hawaii. There isn't a single student I wasn't able to put asleep after lunch, so you, you folks are probably going to have to suffer through uh, my droning on and on. But this is the second half of uh, my two-part uh, presentation or lecture today. And again, it's on advanced technologies for biomass energy use. Um, you'll recall that I began earlier with a discussion on uh, the global energy consumption and biomass or bioenergy's contribution, uh, potential benefits and drawbacks of bioenergy. Then I spoke about some of the important factors of um, bioenergy um, and uh, properties of the fuels, uh, feedstocks, etc. Um, then talked about some of the energy crops that, that we're looking in, at in Hawaii. And, um, and then uh, looked at bio-based heat and power and primarily used the sugar industry as a, just a, an example of, of how you might apply that. Uh, and then covered first, second, and third, and fourth generation biofuels. In fact, uh, as I was speaking to my colleague, uh, Eric there, um, we didn't even know there were four different biofuels until kind of recently preparing for, for this presentation, in fact. I kind of knew there were three, um, but I didn't realize there were four. Um, picking up from there, this afternoon, I'm gonna, I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to cover the four different generation biofuels, uh, which I did. Uh, I'm gonna then move on to the bioenergy conversion pathways and then renewable drop-in fuels, whereas I, I spoke about uh, electricity generation earlier and some of the technologies, uh, mostly you know, somewhat mature, that might be used for electricity generation. When it comes to uh, renewable drop-in biofuels, um, really, uh, except for the oleochemical or oil-based pathways, uh, there's nothing really commercial uh, available right now. I mean, there are a lot of things in development, a lot of things that have been demonstrated, but not much uh, commercial activity going on. Um, and then I'll talk about the biggest bottlenecks towards uh, producing uh, drop-in biofuels, and that would be both the hydrogen and the oxygen challenges. And, and I'll elaborate on what that means. Then look at the thermal, the bio, bio and oleochemical platforms and then finally, I'm going to make a small plug for my course uh, at uh, the University of Hawaii on biosystems unit operations. I know a few of you are engineers, and um, if, uh, you know, if, if you decide you wanted to study a little bit uh, at UH, maybe for a semester or whatever, uh, you can take my, my course. Uh, I think you'll find it quite relevant to this whole area of uh, bioenergy conversion. Okay, um, I already did this, and so I'm, I'm going to passed by uh, or through all of this, first, second, third, and fourth generation biofuels. And uh, I already, no, I didn't. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, I think I may have flashed this uh, uh, graphic up earlier, and it's the bioenergy conversion pathways. And this is uh, something that was done by my colleague, uh, Dr. Scott Turn uh, at the Hawaii Natural Energy at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and a good colleague, uh, a professional friend of uh, Dr. Swanee. But um, if you take a look at the different pathways, and I think uh, Swanee showed maybe even a bigger one than this, um, there are a number that we're interested in Hawaii, and, and it would be probably very appropriate to the uh, Brazilian context as well. I just found out that in fact, we're at, uh, I think Hawaii is at about 20 to 22 degrees uh, north latitude, and Sao Paulo is at 23. So basically, we're the mirror image of, of Sao Paulo. Uh, whatever you feel here, except for the cold day today, we, we never get anything cold like this, but um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same, um, same type of um, climate. And so the same crops probably will grow. Um, you know, at the top we have uh, sugar cane, sweet sorghum, which are basically sugar and fiber uh, feedstocks. On the sugar platform, of course, we can go directly into fermentation to produce ethanol, um, as well as in sweet sorghum. Uh, cassava and corn are starch-based crops, uh, 
and there are many others, of course. Those will go through some kind of hydrolysis to break them down into the, you know, in, into the monomer sugars, and the monomer sugars, uh, primarily the, the glucose portion, can be fermented into ethanol. Uh, then we've got a whole host of fiber-only crops. Uh, this would be, it says here, guinea grass, banner grass, um, I can't even read, uh, eucalyptus, uh, lucena. So these two are grasses, these two are tree crops. Uh, primarily fiber crops, and those uh, can go through a host of different processes. Uh, for example, in uh, they can be hydrolyzed uh, into their fermentable sugars, both the six carbon and the five carbon sugars, uh, and uh, turned into ethanol. Uh, they can be gasified, and the gas uh, through the gasification process uh, with some uh, intermediate uh, processing whether it's mainly just cleanup of the particulates, if you're going to go to power pr production um, and removal of some of the um, you know, problematic uh, constituents, such as potassium oxide and so on, um, if you went to uh, power generation, or if you went into um, a uh, drop-in biofuel pathway, you would need to process it somehow. And depending on which application you want, uh, there are different types of, of processing you, you will need, and you'll become an expert by the time uh, you're done today. Um, we have, of course, pyrolysis, which uh, gasification, uh, well, we have combustion on one end, which is uh, full oxidation of your biomass. Yeah? So you've got just, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, you've got water vapor, carbon dioxide, and excess air in your products and you're trying to get as much thermal energy out of it. Um, then moving up the line, uh, gasification would be partial oxidation. You only up give it you know, a partial of the amount that it needs to be uh, fully uh, combusted, and that will, of course, produce a certain intermediate products such as methane, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, some products of combustion like water vapor and, and combustion uh, and, and CO2. Um, and uh, you'll have a syngas that you can use for various purposes. Um, if you don't use any external oxygen at all, then you have a pyrolysis process in which you're just using the oxygen in the fuel to basically provide some of the energy or some of the combustion needed to drive that reaction, but very often you don't have enough, so you'll have to apply additional heat um, to, to, to uh, volatilize all of the... Um, you know, whatever's going to come off, and what you end up with is a large amount of char, unburnt carbon that remains in the solid phase. Um, so all of those um, apply uh, for fiber crops. Then we've got the uh, oil crops, jatropha, kukui, uh, microalgae, soybean, peanut, sunflower, oil palm, and so on. Those, of course, uh, would go through some type of extraction process to remove the oil, uh, and then you could then just transesterify it, uh, as, as we showed earlier, um, to get the fame, uh, fatty acid, methyl esters, um, or um, as shown here, you could take the oil and go through various processes to maybe produce some drop-in fuel. So there's a myriad of, of different types of um, uh, you know, ways you can try to massage this, uh, uh, the different types of feedstocks, depending on what you're trying to produce at the back end and, um, and, and how much uh, you're, you're, you're willing to um, pay for it. Okay. Now, let me talk about renewable drop-in fuels, because that's really what we're looking at in Hawaii. Whereas, for example, the state of Hawaii has a commitment to become 100% uh, renewable um, in terms of its electricity generation by 2045, we don't see any real pathway to, become, to becoming completely renewable in terms of our transportation fuels. Uh, in fact, we don't even see any way of becoming self-sustainable because we don't produce any fossil fuels. So everything has to be, in fact, imported. Our easiest pathway to being uh, renewable or largely renewable in terms of our uh, transportation fuel requirements is through biomass. There are very few other ways you can do it. Yeah? Uh, I, I guess you could you know, generate electricity and through electrolysis produce hydrogen 
and that could become a transportation fuel. But right now, uh, as far as meeting our um, petroleum-like requirements for transportation fuels, about the only choice we have is uh, to use uh, biomass. So, um, so biomass is important, and so renewable drop-in biofuels, uh, which I'll define in a second, is very important to us in, in Hawaii and, and probably, well, certainly to the U.S. Department of Energy as well. Um, renewable drop-in biofuels are fuels that are derived from biomass sources uh, which are physically and chemically interchangeable with petroleum, gasoline, diesel, or jet fuel, and are infrastructurally compatible with conventional petroleum. So we're looking at two things. We want to make sure that whatever we produce, uh, these renewable drop-in biofuels, basically they're, um, they're real true surrogates of these main uh, you know, uh, petroleum-based fuels, okay? They're, they're indistinguishable. They have the same type of um, composition. They have the same heating value, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They perform the same as, um, as these traditional uh, uh, fuels do. And, and you, can, uh, you can imagine, especially when it comes to uh, renewable jet fuel, we want something that pretty much looks like jet fuel. We don't want something that kind of you know, more or less looks like jet fuel and pretty much performs not too bad, kind of like jet fuel, because um, we just soon not see too many jets go down. Um, and, and infrastructurally, they need to be compatible as well. We want to make sure that these biofuels, these renewable drop-in fuels, can go through the same you know, systems, conveyance systems, et cetera, as our standard fuels do. Um, so renewable gasoline is a biofuel that meets uh, this AM, ASTM method. Uh, renewable diesel fuel is a biofuel that meets this ASTM method. Um, and then renewable jet fuel is a biofuel that meets this ASTM method. And you can see all, you know, look them up and see what those methods entail in terms of determining whether these are real legitimate um, drop-in biofuels. Okay. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going to leave my uh, colleague Scott Turns' uh, pathways behind. Uh, this is somewhat more confined. Now we're looking at only biofuels, drop-in biofuels. And these are the various uh, pathways that we have. Uh, basically, we begin with the sun, of course, photosynthesis, and then we can produce biomass fiber uh, or oil seed crops, um, uh, autotrophic algae, uh, you know, which um, much of ours are, uh, uh, or uh, some of ours are, much of them is phototrophic, in fact. And, um, and then uh, fiber, of course. And then with this, uh, we can go through all of the processes that I talked about in the earlier slide. Uh, you know, fermentation, uh, some of it uh, uh, taking syngas from gasification and catalyty catalytically converting it into a fissure trope liquid. Um, we can go through pyrolysis, produce a char, and bio oil, take the bio oil fraction, upgrade it, and produce, um, what is that? Now I forgot what that was, uh, hydro process oil or something like that. Um, here, um, for example, in this uh, commercial system. And, or we can take any of these oil products, uh, the lipids from, um, uh, you know, from oil seed crops, from animal uh, products, or from uh, algae, and then go this route um, from the lipids uh, directly into hydroprocessing. And, uh, and then in all of these, I'll show you later, we have to take a final step, and I'll explain why we need to take these, this final step before we can have what we consider to be a drop-in fuel, okay, either uh, blended with traditional drop-in fuels or just used as standalone drop-in fuels. Okay. Um, okay. okay, now let me talk about the, the hydrogen and oxygen challenges. Um, and uh, this is a real problem when it comes to uh, drop-in fuels. Uh, gasoline, if you take a look at what it looks like and, and how we model it in, in any type of chemical engineering, for example, 
for mechanical engineering system, we usually model it as octane, uh, which is C8H18. So with that, it has a hydrogen to carbon ratio, and I'm talking about just atoms here on an atom basis, of about 2.25. Diesel fuel, I'll often model it by, I have a hard time pronouncing this sometimes, cyclodotacane, and that has uh, a chemical formula of C12H24, which has a hydrogen to carbon ratio of 2.0. Um, jet fuel often is modeled by decane, and uh, that has a chemical composition of C10H22. That has a hydrogen to carbon ratio of 2.2. I think it becomes extremely clear in looking at the three things that we're trying to replace, one thing that we need to try to shoot for, and that is a hydrogen to carbon ratio of 2.0 or slightly higher. If we don't get that, we will not have anything that in fact is chemically identical to these drop-in fuels, okay? So that's one thing that we've got to shoot for. Um, a uh, hydrogen to carbon ratio of um, uh, 2.0 or slightly higher. Now it turns out, of course, as you well know, during combustion of any fuel, any oxygen that we have is gonna either turn into H2O or CO2, and it turns out that it uh, preferenti preferentially wants to become H2O, so it's gonna steal some of the hydrogen that's in the fuel. So not only do we need to have a ratio of hydrogen to carbon equal to 2.0, we have to have it even higher than that if we have oxygen in there. Um, so it turns out that what we want to do is, in general, we want the effective hydrogen to carbon ratio for oxygenated feedstocks to have um, a value that's equal to two. And, and, and the effective one is calculated as the number of hydrogen atoms minus twice the number of oxygen atoms, because that's the H2O portion, divided by the number of carbon atoms, okay? So we want that effective hydrogen to carbon ratio to be two. And the wider the gap we have between two and whatever number it is, and it's always less than two, by the way, um, that means we just have to put in more work, and usually what it means is we have to put in more hydrogen into the process in order to make it a drop in biofuel. Um, let me just show you an example. I think I have one. Oh, yeah, okay, so here are the, car here are the targets, by the way. Uh, hydrogen, effective hydrogen to carbon ratio should be two, and we have to strip out all the oxygen, because take a look at these. None of these, uh, you know, model compounds here, octane, cyclodotacane, and, and decane have oxygen in them. Uh, you know, our, our petroleum transportation fuels don't have any oxygen in them, okay? They're pure hydrocarbons, and that's what we need to do. We need to make sure that uh, not only do we have a, an effective hydrogen to carbon, mono, uh, carbon ratio of two, we got to strip out all the oxygen as well. And those are the two big challenges that we face with everything um, when it comes to, um, uh, with, uh, when it comes to these drop-in biofuels. Uh, but we're not alone. Uh, actually, uh, the fossil side, they have the same problem as well. Uh, not so much when they work with uh, coal, which in fact, is really bad. This is what we call the hydrogen to carbon stairway, okay? Uh, way at the bottom, it's zero, and then as you move up, you become more and more like a real drop-in biofuel. And when you reach 2.0, you're, you're there. Um, if we began with coal, we've got a long way to go. Um, and then there are others, oil sand, heavy crude is, is around here, maybe one to one and a half. Uh, there, we're kind of closer to you know, our, our transportation fuels, so we don't have to do quite as much work. Um, and then as we get to light crude and then diesel oil, we're, we're basically there, okay? So, so uh, we're, we're pretty close and there's very little massaging we need to do in order to get from where we are at that point as feedstocks into uh, the kind of transportation fuels we're looking to replace. Um, and so what you'll see in, in the uh, refineries is because they, they often start out with some of these, heavy crude and light crude. Even in refineries, they have the same challenge. Um, they have an oxygen problem that they need to address, and they have especially the hydrogen problem that they need to address. And what they've done uh, in the past is they've found ways of 
deoxygenating, uh, hydro-treating, et cetera, their, their feedstocks, the heavy crude and light crude, so that they can then produce real transportation fuels. We will take, of course, the same step when we produce our own uh, biofuels, but we face somewhat bigger challenges. Um, this is the same stairway right here, but you can see that our feedstocks are, re I mean, they really suck. Um, right here, we have glucose, for example. Um, you know, C6H12O6, well, the effective hydrogen to carbon ratio is zero on that one. So we've got a long way to go. We've got to go from zero to two. Uh, if we began with, um, and, and that would apply, of course, to um, cellulose as well, um, because glucose is cellulose. Um, bio oil has a hydrogen to effect, uh, effective hydrogen to carbon ratio of about 0.2 to 0.5. So, you know, we would be in this region right here. Um, if we had, you know, the good thing is if we began with something like canola oil, okay, canola oil, uh, which kind of looks like C12H20O, that has an effective hydrogen to carbon ratio of 1.5. So that's about as good as um, heavy crude already. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting pretty close to, um, uh, to that 2.0 target. Uh, and then finally, uh, our target is way up here at 2.0, and uh, that's pretty much where, where we need to go, okay? So we have to do a lot of things, uh, hydro treat it, add hydrogen to the fuel in order to try to boost the hydrogen level to get it up to, to that level. But we have other problems beside that. Well, let me uh, digress a little bit. Uh, so as I said earlier, most um, refineries already have different processes in place at the refinery to um, add hydrogen to their uh, feedstock in order to uh, upgrade or bring that hydrogen to carbon ratio up to 2.0. And uh, typically what they do is they'll have um, methane uh, from natural gas readily available and they'll convert that methane into hydrogen using a couple of different steps. So the two steps that they normally use uh, is steam reforming of methane and that's shown uh, right here. Uh, methane plus water is equal to CO plus uh, 3H2, and they'll take the hydrogen and use that uh, to, um, to uh, you know, boost the hydrogen content in, 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 their, in their petroleum fuels. Uh, or they'll use the water gas shift reaction, uh, which might take the CO there, uh, add water to it, and then produce CO2 and H2, uh, to then get additional hydrogen. Now one of these I think is exothermic and the other one is endothermic process, but both of them are high temperature processes, so it takes a lot of energy to, to, to do these, or it takes a lot of heat recovery to get that energy back. Um, now the same thing, um, you know, both the uh, steam reforming and the water gas shift reaction in theory works in biomass systems as well. Uh, in fact, uh, here from our own project, uh, I show you some, um, uh, some data that we got uh, from our biomass steam and oxygen gasification uh, uh, experiments to try to produce hydrogen. We're always interested in producing hydrogen, perhaps for fuel cell use or for other uses such as to use for hydro treating um, our feedstocks to make them uh, into uh, petroleum uh, you know, surrogates. Um, here you see our, uh, our gasifier, um, and we ran that gasifier at different temperatures, uh, uh, different, and by the way, the small gasifier, the one I showed earlier uh, today, is big. Um, the steam rate, the oxygen rate, and so on, and, and then we got uh, the following uh, products. Um, uh, 31 percent hydrogen here, 39 percent here, and 45 percent there. Uh, you know, as, as we went up in temperature. Uh, and, and here's a graphical representation of that. Again, at 750, uh, pretty much everything except for the temperature was held at the, at the same value, okay? So we had uh, 750 degrees, 850 degrees, 950 degrees uh, Celsius gasification process. Uh, and you can see the theoretical and the experimental values orange for theoretical, blue for experimental values for hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane, and carbon dioxide 
again, what we were trying to do was produce as much hydrogen as possible. We wanted to produce hydrogen as an end product. Of course, we have other things that come out, but uh, the CO and the methane, not bad, because we can always use that, in fact, uh, to heat this uh, endothermic process. Um, I have a question for you, uh, and this is the one I gave my class as well in my uh, unit operations course. Uh, a couple of things. For, for those of you who are engineers or, or chemists, etc., how is the theoretical gas composition determined? Okay, I, I'm, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you want to, you can. Um, uh, do any of you know how you determine the equilibrium gas composition for something like this? Or the equilibrium composition of any kind of um, uh, chemical and probably even a biological process? Anybody know? Shout it out if you do. Okay, well, a uh, couple of things. Um, number one, what you do is you minimize the Gibbs free energy. Uh, for those of you who uh, you know, are, are physical chemists uh, or, or mechanical engineers like I am, or chemical engineers, you'd know that uh, basically when you have any type of uh, you know, process going on, a uh, thermochemical process, for example, at a certain temperature and pressure, uh, there's going to be a composition of any mixture that you put together uh, in the final product. It's just you know, some of them get there very quickly. Others take a much longer time to reach equilibrium. But equilibrium means, in fact, that's where it gets. So the way you determine what that composition looks like is you calculate the Gibbs free energy, and you try to find out where the, that is minimum. In fact, it's, it's, it's very much akin to what many of you have remembered from your, you know, your thermodynamics uh, 300 class is it's equivalent to maximizing the entropy. You know, you, uh, equilibrium, you know, is the maximum entropy condition. It's also the minimum Gibbs free energy condition. So you try to minimize your Gibbs free energy in making the computation, and that's what tells you what the theoretical is, you know, and then your actual is, of course, whatever you measure. Now, my other question to you as students is, why does the experimental data match the theoretical data better at higher temperatures. So right here, you can see a big difference between blue and orange at 750. As I go to 850, the gap gets smaller. And I go to 950, in fact, my experimental results are almost the same as my theoretical results. Uh, why does that happen? Don't shout it all at one time. OK, I mean, the reason is, as temperature goes up, what happens? The kinetics of the process go faster. I mean, that's what happens in all chemical reactions, right? You heat something up, things react faster, OK? So because this is the equilibrium composition that we're talking about, and as I said, if you hold a certain temperature and pressure long enough, everything will reach its equilibrium condition. Some will get there faster. Others will get there slower. Now, clearly, at higher temperatures, the kinetics occur much faster, so everything is racing towards equilibrium you know, much more so than at lower temperatures. And that's why we get pretty darn good uh, agreement between the experimental and theoretical results as our temperature increases, because the kinetics are just getting better and better and better. OK. You all get A's. Um, so uh, that was part of what we're trying to do in terms of producing hydrogen. There are other ways of producing hydrogen. Uh, one of the projects that we had, uh, which was funded by a private company, <laughs> was to take a look at trying to produce hydrogen from bio oil, that is, from pyrolysis oil. The idea here is this. Um, you know, I talked about the large um, size of a plantation you would need if you're trying to uh, produce a, for example, a biofuel plant, okay? Or maybe even a hydrogen plant. Uh, you'd need large acreages of uh, crop, and then you'd have to haul that crop in and process it at a centralized location. And, uh, and, and, and that hauling cost is very expensive. Uh, so what we thought about doing, by the way, I'm getting kind of warm here. So our client um, said, you know, what if we um, try to decentralize how we produce hydrogen? And, and his idea was 
we would set up small pyrolysis units, which aren't expensive like gasification units. Gasification units uh, operate, uh, you know, very well at, at very large scales, and I mean maybe a thousand tons a day or something like that. Whereas the gasification plants might be viable at 50 tons per day. So we could have small um, you know, pyrolysis plants where we bring in biomass instead of from uh, 40 kilometers out, we only bring in from five kilometers out, two kilometers out to a central or decentralized location. And we have 10 of these uh, pyrolysis systems scattered throughout our entire plantation. And what we would do is we would produce bio oil. You know, the, the pyrolysis process is fairly simple, much simpler than a gasification process. We could produce uh, pyrolysis oils and char, of course. Take the pyrolysis oil, which is much more transportable than biomass feedstock. I mean, probably, I would say, 1 20th the volume of biomass feedstock, and transport that to a central location, and then convert that into whatever uh, kind of fuel or something else we want. And the end product we wanted at that time was hydrogen. So uh, the idea here is after we produce the bio oil, we would then try to convert that into hydrogen. And there was a fairly, I would say, kind of smart process that this person who was our client thought we could do. What he said is, um, why don't we take a look at uh, using calcium oxide as a trap um, for um, for the uh, um, as an absorber for uh, for for what? No. It was as as an absorber for the uh, carbon dioxide. That's right, because that's what we're trying to remove. So we would uh, basically gasify or um, uh, the uh, bio oil, and then we would put it into an absorbing reactor where we would put in uh, our um, calcium carbonate, take that, and then move it over to a desorbing reactor, which is at different pressures. As you change the pressure, ev the equilibrium changes, and instead of now absorbing the uh, carbon dioxide, what it wants to do is it wants to get rid of it. You know, everything goes both ways, yeah? And so once you go into that desorbing reactor, um, the, um, the solid uh, calcium uh, oxide, which has now carbon dioxide in it, it's now become calcium carbonate. It goes into a desorbing reactor, you change the pressure and the temperature, and now it wants to get rid of that carbon dioxide, so it then lets the carbon dioxide loose, and what you have is, again, you're back to ca calcium oxide, and you've gotten rid of the uh, carbon dioxide, and now you have a rich hydrogen sh stream, which then you could use for either hydrogen uses or to upgrade your biofuel. So um, I thought that was a neat system, and, and this was a process simulation that uh, my colleague and I did. The problem with hydrogen production, especially in the earlier one where we talked about doing it through gasification, is that it's highly uh, scale dependent. Um, at uh, low scales, at small scales, and I don't mean very small, I mean here 500 uh, tons per day of, of biomass going into the gasifier. Uh, if you wanted to produce hydrogen, the cost of the hydrogen is going to be so much higher than what it would cost to produce it from natural gas. If you get up to large scales, uh, there's a chance, and I mean 2,000 tons of biomass per day in a fiber, uh, there's a chance that you might be able to match or even be lower than uh, natural gas. Of course, it really depends on what the price of natural gas is. So uh, basically, you're stuck with a problem of, of scale. Again, gasification requires very large scales. Our small demonstration plant was 100 tons per day. You can imagine what a real one would be. Um, okay, and on top of that hydrogen challenge, you have the oxygen challenge. I already said that if you have oxygen in your uh, intermediate, uh, like ethanol does, uh, you still have a problem because you got to get rid of it. Okay, you got to get rid of it. Uh, if you want a true drop-in biofuel, you have to sh you, ha you have to basically, you know, kind of purge all the oxygen out of that that uh, intermediate. So. Um, what kind of intermediates am I talking about? Uh, well, let's talk about first the two first generation biofuels, ethanol and biodiesel. Well, those are good fuels, but they will never be drop-in fuels because they've got oxygen in them. So 
in both cases, in the case of uh, ethanol, I would have to scrub that oxygen out somehow. In the case of uh, biodiesel, uh, I've got oxygen there. I would have to take that out as well. And the reason is oxygen is present in biomass in the form of hydroxyls, esters, and ethers. Um, and, and, uh, and when I say biomass, I don't mean only in biomass, uh, ethanol and, and biodiesel as well. And while these are uh, quite important for uh, you know, metabolic processes in biological systems, they are problematic when you're trying to produce your final fuel. As I said, if you want to produce a drop in fuel, you'll have to take all the oxygen out, okay? It, it can't handle that. Uh, in addition to that, um, well, I already said that ethanol and biodiesel are only partially deoxygenated. Uh, they began with more oxygen when they first were alive as animal fat or as, um, as uh, glucose, but, but they're only partially deoxygenated. They still have a you know, significant amount of oxygen in there, so we have to strip that out. Um, these can oxidize fuel components, corrode, corrode reactors and pipelines, and impact stability and storability. In fact, the oxygen in there is one of the reasons why it makes, uh, I think, biodiesel goes rancid after a while, because it has that oxygen in there. If you stripped it out, it probably would have much lower shelf life. And then, of course, oxygen content reduces energy density, and, and we're trying to shoot for a certain you know, a higher heating value in our fuel. So all of these are problematic, uh, and so we need to get rid of that oxygen. And the way we do that, okay, in, in uh, uh, today's uh, environment is to uh, do one of two things. Deoxygenation of biomass intermediates, such as, for example, either glucose, ethanol, or, or biodiesel, or whatever you might have, um, is usually achieved by two chemical reduction processes, uh, hydrodeoxygenation, HDO, or de decarboxylation. Decarboxylation, decarboxylation, the uh, CO. Okay, and and let's begin with an, um, a glucose molecule right here. It's uh, it's got six oxygen atoms and and it has a, a high effective hydrogen to carbon ratio of zero. And remember, we got to get all the way up to 2.0. Okay, uh, and the way we would do this, perhaps depending on whether we want to go one path or the other and much of that depends on what nature would prefer. When I say nature, I mean our reactor would prefer. Um, we could go with uh, hydrodeoxygenation, that is oxidation of hydrogen. The hydrogen is already in the fuel. We can somehow use that hydrogen and have that react with oxygen to produce H2O. That would strip out the oxygen, okay? Unfortunately, it also strips out our hydrogen which is what we're trying to boost up. So you know, that, that presents a problem. But if we've got something that's extremely high in hydrogen, has some oxygen, and we could afford to lose some of that hydrogen, we would go that route. Um, most, uh, you know, and it turns out that uh, that's not usually the case. Um, uh, we could also go with uh, decarboxylation, and um, that is oxidation of carboxyl group carbon, and in the case of glucose, what we would do is we would take the carbon that's already there and, um, and then try to react it with the uh, oxygen to strip out the oxygen and uh, produce CO2, and that would eventually, whether we went this route or this route, and again, we're not free to just choose whatever route we want. Uh, the laws of thermodynamics and everything else will uh, you know, determine what, in fact, we do, uh, we would then produce, uh, be able to produce a surrogate uh, drop in fuel that, that is free of oxygen. Uh, for example, butane, uh, which is, uh, has this chemical formula right here, and it has a hydrogen to carbon ratio of two, and it has no oxygen in it. So in fact, that is one where we're pretty much there, okay? Okay. Um, I can see some eyes glazing over at this point, but I'll, I'll, I'll just keep going because I've never been ashamed of putting folks to sleep. Um, you know, if, if, here's the uh, thermochemical platform. We'll take a look at that in, in a second, uh, for a second, and it's mostly fiber-based. But I show here two f uh, phase diagrams, okay? Um, biomass in both uh, cases is right around here when it comes to the amount of carbon, 
hydrogen and oxygen. You can just think of this as a, um, uh, you know, if, if, if you strip apart your, your, your fuel, how much carbon, hydrogen, oxygen would it have, and, and where would it fit on that triangle, okay? And um, so if um, looking at this, uh, we've got different, uh, on the left-hand side, I show different types of fuels, biomass, uh, some solid fuels, uh, coal, for example, and then uh, cellulose is there somewhere. I can't see it, uh, but it's there somewhere. And um, uh, char is there, and then liquid fuels are up here. Um, and then, of course, gaseous fuels, syngas, for example, would be here. And then our uh, products of combustion would be there. And beginning with biomass, depending on whether you want to push some H2O into it, put some hydrogen into it, put some oxygen into it, put, uh, you know, or, or try to drive it towards the carbon side, you would do different things to, to make it move in that direction. Okay? The right-hand side pretty much shows you um, what different processes will kind of push biomass towards. For example, again, biomass is right here in terms of its carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen mix. If you steam gasify it, it will move in this direction where you will begin to produce hydrogen and uh, water vapor, of course. Um, if you put oxygen into it, such as in gasifiers, you would then push it in this direction to produce a gaseous fuel. We call that syngas. If you put more oxygen into it, you will push it this side, and what do you do? Basically, what you're doing is just combusting it. So you'll have a lot of oxygen in your products, and you'll have a gas that's high in thermal energy but doesn't have any chemical energy at all. If you wanted to pyrolyze it, you would push it this way, uh, not adding any uh, oxygen into it, and you would end up with uh, pretty much char and, and oils. And then finally, if you put hydrogen into it, you would push it this way uh, towards the hydrogen side, which typically would be on the methane side. You began with you know, some carbon to hydrogen ratio, and as you added more and more hydrogen to it, you would have something that's higher in hydrogen content, such as CH4. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, just to kind of give you a quick overview of the different types of thermochemical conversion processes, these are some of the ones that uh, you, know, you probably have heard of, some of them at least, uh, and, and I'll just summarize them. Uh, you know, way at the top, uh, we have, uh, by the way, these are also the conditions that um, are used to uh, create those products. And uh, this is the amount of solid, liquid, and gas products that uh, typically are generated in these processes. So way at the top, we've got torrefaction, extremely low temperature processes, and we've got retention times you know, of uh, 10 to 60 minutes. So uh, we're talking about very slow processes. Think about maybe your toast in your toaster oven or something like that. I mean, it'll take a long time, and what you'll end up with is very little gas, uh, very little liquid, but of course a lot of burnt toast Okay, in, in that process. Uh, uh, it's worse than our, our toaster because, in fact, in our toaster we have some oxygen. Here we wouldn't have any. Uh, in your conventional uh, pyrolysis system, uh, we're looking at maybe 400 degrees, higher temperature. Uh, oh, look at that. The retention time might be hours or days. Uh, I guess I'm trying to produce uh, uh, charcoal in this case. Uh, and here I have 35% char, 30% uh, liquids, and 35% and gas. Uh, then I have intermediate pyrolysis, which is at higher temperature, shorter residence time. And then finally, flash pyrolysis, which is, I think, what a lot of uh, research has been done on, just trying to zap that thing through at a fairly high temperature and have uh, basically the, the biomass almost ablate of surfaces and, and you know, part of it will gasify. You'll produce, at the end, uh, quite a bit of um, char, uh, in this case 12%, uh, a large amount of liquids. Uh, you know, bio oil, and then a small amount of gas. Uh, contrast that with, um, you know, again, very high temperatures, uh, uh, gasification, 750 to 900 degrees, and you're looking at a very quick residence time in both of these of about one second. Okay, so now, now we're talking about 
Uh, now, now we're really burning. We're, we're moving fast through that system, uh, and we can put a lot through. So, you know, not surprisingly, that's why our gasifier can be can can process 2,000 tons a day because it's moving that stuff so quickly through. Whereas, imagine if you've got a a residence time of hours or days, you're not going to be pushing much through there, uh, no matter how big your your gasifier or your uh, pyrolysis unit is. Uh, with gasification, um, Dr. Turn says 10% char. I, I, I beg to differ. I think it's much less than that, but perhaps it is. 5% uh, liquids, I, I, I guess, if you consider all of the oils and tars and try to condense that, yes, you probably would have that much. Uh, the vast majority is gas, your syngas, and that can be processed downstream. And then finally, of course, combustion. High temperatures, very little uh, char left behind uh, if you do a good process. Uh, very little liquids left behind because uh, basically everything vaporized. You don't have very many tars and oils in there, so nothing's going to condense out. And then what you have is primarily gas. Okay. Okay. I'm going to race through these because they will. I guarantee you, nobody will be awake after I'm done with with this stuff. Um, We'll talk about solid fuel combustion. There are various processes in this. First, we're talking about, you know, you've got your solid uh, particle, might be gas, might be wood chips. Uh, basically, what you do is quickly heat and dry uh, the material, mostly on the outside, of course. And then what will happen is immediately after it gets up to a certain temperature, some of the uh, you know, solid will volatilize, yeah? and you'll have more than char left behind. And even that will combust because the temperatures are high. So you've got your char there. All of the gases or all of the solids that are volatile will come out. And in fact, I showed you earlier uh, what we call proximate analysis. You've got your fixed carbon. You've got your volatiles. And then, you know, and so on. So, and, and you've got your um, ash. So that's what this represents, yeah. Uh, and then, so your, your volatile gases will come out, H2O, O2, CO2. Uh, and some intermediates here, but those will be burnt. And then finally, uh, you'll have the biomass shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller as you have heat and mass transport you know, and combustion working together to um, complete this process. Um, you know, if you were to look at the stoichiometry, uh, this is as simple as it possibly can get. Um, your biomass, as, as you all know, uh, consists of carbon, hydrogen, uh, and a whole bunch of uh, small constituents, but carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen primarily, because it's, it's, it's basically um, lignocellulosic cellulosic material, which kind of looks, like, uh, looks like cellulose, and what is cellulose? It looks like glucose, and glucose you know, it has oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen in it, so pretty much that's what you begin with. And so y all you do is you decide what your what your uh, polymer looks like, um, or your, your, your biomass feedstock looks like, and um, then uh, you, you can use a certain amount of uh, oxidant in it, depending on whether you want to be stoichiometric, or as usually is the case, because you want everything to burn, you go, in fact, uh, and put excess air in there. And so you can calculate all of that. This represents, of course, the composition of air. Uh, it's uh, 21% oxygen, 79% uh, nitrogen. And uh, once you, uh, you know, figure out what this is, you just take it over to the left hand, right hand side and you see what your combustion products are going to be. If, for example, uh, what I used to do with sugarcane boilers is I'd want to know how much excess air they're burning with. So I'd simply get some type of uh, analyzer, put it into the gas stream downstream of the combustor and measure the amount of excess air, and I could you know, determine everything from that. Um, so moving along, uh, there are a bunch of criteria pollutants that are strictly regulated by the EPA, Department of Health, etc. They're all listed there. Um, so you know, pretty much that's it in a nutshell. Uh, if I got to gasification, all that means is I would begin again with biomass that looks like, oh, I have that there. Uh, you know, begin with biomass, and then instead of fully oxidizing it, I would partially oxidize it, and then I would come out with different types of products, usually methane, carbon monoxide, uh, water vapor, of course, no excess oxygen, um, 
and nitrogen I would have if I use uh, you know, air as the oxidant, or I wouldn't have if I use only oxygen as the oxidant. Uh, what else would I have in there? A whole bunch of probably uh, higher hydrocarbons. Um, so very much like um, uh, combustion, we have uh, similar uh, physical phenomena going on. I won't belabor that. Uh, here is the uh, reaction. Again, this one is uh, using air as its oxidant. And very much like I had in the case of uh, uh, combustion, I would see a whole host of expected products on the right-hand side. Of course, those are not all the products. When I run my equilibrium composition calculations for this, I assume a whole bunch of other products just to make sure that I'm putting the entire universe of possible uh, products in there. But the main ones that normally you would find would be uh, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane, carbon dioxide, uh, and, and water vapor. Okay. Um, uh, I, just in passing, I list here the various types of reactions that they have here. We've got heterogeneous reactions, which are those that occur between different phases, solid and gas, for example, reactions. So many of these would be uh, solid phase reactions, things that are happening right on the uh, you know, surface of the biomass. And then we've got homogeneous reactions, which largely would be those that once things happen on the surface and get into the gas stream, then other reactions would occur. And the main ones that happen in uh, biomass gas stations are the ones that are shown here. Um, I talked about earlier the water gas shift reaction. That's an important one in, um, in biomass gas station. Uh, methanation reaction. Uh, you see the uh, uh, change in enthalpy of uh, reaction. And uh, for those of you who remember your chemistry 101, um, your delta H sub R, if it's less than zero, if it's minus, it's an exothermic reaction. If it's positive, it's an endothermic reaction. In other words, you're putting energy into it uh, in order to, to get it to go. Uh, you know, uh, Suwani and I talked about some gasifier alternatives uh, while we were having lunch. And uh, here are just some essential features of different types of gasifiers are out, out there. Uh, You've got air-blown updraft uh, gas fires. I, I, I didn't bring cartoons with me, but um, these are the gases that you might expect to see. You can see that, of course, anything that's air-blown using air as your oxidant will, of course, necessarily have a lot of nitrogen in your products. Yeah. So the nitrogen concentration for these air-blown uh, gas fires is very high. Now, of course, that presents a real problem. Nitrogen is good for nothing. Uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it basically is just, it, it's a thermal drain. You're heating all of this stuff up, so in the meantime, you're heating nitrogen up, and uh, it's, you know, chemically, it's not going to do anything for you. In fact, uh, all it'll do is probably produce nitrogen oxides, which are something you'd rather not have. Uh, so very often, what you try to do is avoid having uh, nitrogen by going with oxygen gasification that is feeding oxygen in directly. Uh, so we've got uh, our oxygen blown uh, downdraft, indirectly heated, fluidized bed uh, gasifiers. And you can see the energy content in this. Largely, it depends on, of course, the nitrogen concentration. If nitrogen concentration is high, you have very low heating value. If the nitrogen concentration is low, you have high heating value. The indirectly heated uh, fluid bed gasifier is uh, an interesting one because what this is is instead of putting and oxidant in there, oxygen in there, to provide the reactions needed to um, uh, you know, have some exothermic processes going on. You don't put any oxygen in there. You heat it indirectly using sand or something like that. So you don't need the combustion processes occurring along with the gasification processes, which are reducing processes. And, and you can still get, in fact, a very complete gasification and, um, and have a very high heating value. Um, you know, all of these will work in gas turbines, but some of these work better. Uh, and, and these will be totally unacceptable if you wanted to produce transportation fuels because now you've got to find a way to strip that nitrogen out. You can't have that in there. Okay, and tires and oils and so on are listed there. Um, in gasification, oh, yes. Stop listening to myself for a while. 
Um, I had a question about the previous slide, if you can go back to it. Um, yeah, can you please explain a bit what is indirectly heated fluidized batch? How does it work? And okay. what is the oxidizer in this case? Okay, okay. Uh, if I understood your question right, you wanted to know how the indirectly heated gasifier works. Yeah. Okay, um, usually very simple. Um, what you'll typically do is Imagine, imagine having a gasifier that has um, a fluidized bed gasifier, okay? So you've got alumina or something pellets inside uh, that form the bed, and you've got, or maybe sand, or something like that, that's the fluidizing bed, okay? And you're, um, and you're gasifying biomass. What happens is you typically use only steam, okay? No oxygen, just steam and you're steam gasifying the biomass, and you put it through at a very high throughput. So it not only takes the gases up, but it takes char particles up, and it takes the sand particles out, okay? And it goes into another unit where um, they combust something, heat up that fan, okay? Heat up that fan through a combustion process. Maybe they take some of the char that, that came out use that in a combustor next door. So you've got your gasifier here, you've got your combustor right here. You're blowing all of that hot sand into this side. You're taking some of the combustibles or maybe just some product gas, using it to heat up that sand. And then you take the sand and put it back into that first gasifier. Now you've got something that's what we call indirectly heated, okay? It's not heated by the reactions that are occurring in this gasifier, it's being heated by sand that was, you know, that was heated externally of that gasifier. And there are other indirectly heated gasifiers. You could, you could have, for example, a gasifier that's somewhat uh, fluidized bed or, you know, it could be an updraft, downdraft, but you could have tubes inside, what we call fire tubes, okay? So these would be tubes, and what you would take is maybe gases that you're producing, take part of that, combust it, and put it back into the tubes, that way you would have high heat transfer, but you're not putting any oxygen into the gas fire. You're getting the heat externally. Okay? Does Thank that you. make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the whole purpose of, of, of gasification is to produce some type of syngas. Um, I use that term loosely. I, I think, uh, you know, in the petrol industry, uh, syngas is uh, a gas that has a hydrogen to carbon monoxide ratio of two. Um, but here, um, I'm, I'm talking about just, you know, gases that have uh, a lot of hydrogen in it and carbon monoxide in it, and we want to do different things with it. And that's what uh, gasifiers do. They produce some type of syngas. And once you have that syngas, uh, you then are free to do a number of things. Uh, the most common are um, you could, uh, using a Fischer-Trope process, which is a process that's been around for, gee, I, I think it was uh, invented by the Germans, um, maybe World War I or something like that, during a time when I guess everybody was uh, embargoing, by the way, if anybody knows the truth, as, as opposed to my speculation, uh, it was, I think, produced by the Germans, but, you know, way back when, I think they were probably being boycotted uh, by the world, and nobody wanted to give them any gasoline, so they had to produce their own, and, the, and they produced it using this fischer trough process. So it'll take uh, syngas, and using some type of catalyst, it'll upgrade that syngas into some hydrocarbon, alkanes, and then eventually, uh, depending on which pathway they want to go, they can produce diesel oil or gasoline or olefins. So that's one common way. And that fischer trope process has been refined over and over and over again. It's been used for coal gasification, uh, upgrading, biomass gasification, upgrading for, you know, for a whole host of things. And in fact, it is a working system that, that has worked for now. Uh, probably approaching 80 years or something like that. So it's old technology, but it has improved. Um, at the other end of the extreme, we can take syngas and uh, by using certain catalysts uh, produce um, from the syngas, uh, which is, uh, again, 
mice and gas, uh, 2H2 and one part CO, and make methanol, CH3OH, I think, methanol. So that, that would be, you know, one part, uh, two parts hydrogen, 2H2 plus CO equals CH3OH, which is methanol, and so you, you could do that with a catalyst, and using that methanol, you then can produce a number of different things, uh, including gasoline, for example, using certain types of hydroprocessing, et cetera, to move it uh, towards that, again, hydrogen to C ratio of two, and stripping out all the oxygen. Uh, on the other side, well, I mean, and then we have a whole host of other things, of course, that we can produce in between. Yep. I talked about hydrogen generation and so on. So syngas is, um, you know, once you have syngas, you can pretty much do anything you want with it, um, as, as the uh, petroleum industry is doing. Uh, pyrolysis is even worse than, than gasification. You've got, uh, you're producing the same types of things again, uh, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, uh, methane, uh, carbon dioxide, and, and, and water, except in addition to that, you're producing uh, condensables, bio oil, and char as part of the reaction. So that's, you know, and, and that's what you're trying to do with um, uh, pyrolysis. You're trying to produce a whole suite of different products. Uh, I'm not so much interested in the, you know, in the gas phase. Um, if you have any, in fact, what you want to do is just burn it and use that for, you know, serving your thermal needs, but you're mainly interested in the char, perhaps, uh, for carbon sequestration or for charcoal or something like that, uh, and you're interested in the oil as bio-oil so that you can produce hydrogen or some type of um, uh, transportation fuel. Okay, ah, here, this is uh, an interesting one. At least I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a comparison of bio-oil or pyrolysis oil versus heavy fuel oil. So it would be nice if, um, if uh, bio oil were exactly the same as heavy fuel oil because the petroleum industry deals with heavy fuel oil every day. That's the main feedstock to begin with. So in fact, if your bio oil looked like that, then very easy. We already have processes to treat that bio oil and make it into uh, petroleum fuel, okay? Um, and as you can see here, Actually, they're not that much different. Well, the water content is, is different, of course, in bio oil, but that's easy. I can always strip the water off. That's not a problem, okay? Um, the carbon uh, ratio, I mean, carbon concentration is a little lower. Um, hydrogen, a little lower. Um, nitrogen, uh, a little lower. Ash, um, about the same. Higher heating value, significantly lower, etc. But the biggest difference between the two not surprisingly, is the oxygen. Yeah? I mean, bio oil has a lot of oxygen in it, and therefore, I'm going to have to spend a lot of effort in trying to get rid of that oxygen by either one of the two processes that I talked about. Now I can't remember the name of them, but anyway, one of them involved um, converting the hydrogen into water, and the other one involved uh, converting the carbon into water, and in both cases, probably having to put hydrogen in it to bring it back up, okay? Um, uh, here's an example of hydro-treating of bio-oil. Here's my chemical formula, a fake one, uh, but more or less a good uh, model for bio-oil right there. I add hydrogen, and then I change that to um, uh, a um, fuel uh, that, that looks like um, uh, transportation fuels. It has a hydrogen to carbon, monox uh, carbon ratio of two, and it has no oxygen in it. Uh, and then I've got a whole bunch of uh, water vapor coming out the backside. And this is pretty much what the um, um, uh, you know, process looks like uh, from a schematic standpoint. I have my uh, bio oil coming in, uh, hydro treat it, and hydro treatment, hydro catalysis, I think is that HC. I think that's what it stands for. Uh, then I do a separation. Uh, and then go into some type of column and, and then split it up into light products, which would be my uh, transportation fuels, um, medium products, and, and some of the heavy products, those I would probably just burn. Um, uh, here is, in fact, a, a diagram, a better one, I think, of how I would do it. I would go, oh, HC for hydrocracking, not hydro, whatever I said. Um, 
So I'd go into my hydro treating unit uh, using catalysts and hydrogen. I'd boost the hydrogen up. Then I'd go into a hydro cracking unit, adding more hydrogen and catalysts. And then finally, the gases that come out, um, I would then have gases that, that basically would be hydrocarbons. I could just condense those out. Uh, and then I'd have different liquid phases that I'd get rid of. And then so finally, the solids, uh, I'd have char and coke, and I'd use that for other processes, of course. Um, OK. I'm getting close to the end, you know, so I think those of you are still awake. Uh, here's a biochemical platform, and here I'll go over it very quickly. Of course, we've got photosynthesis. We produce plant biomass and, and sugars, etc. cetera. And uh, the first generation, what they have in uh, Brazil, for example, and in the United States, we would take our sugars or our starches, convert it into sugars, and basically just go directly through here. And this would be a C6 sugar pathway, cellulose, uh, sorry, glucose. And we would take the glucose, ferment it with yeast, and then produce ethanol. So that's uh, what everybody does right now. Of course, that's not the only way to skin that cat. We have a lot of different ways to uh, convert biomass into, uh, into the ones we really want, which is, which is our um, uh, drop-in biofuels you know, down here. So we could go, for example, with our lignocellulosic material instead of our sugars and um, break that up into C5 sugars and C6 sugars. And C6 sugars, of course, would go to our yeast. The C5 sugars might go through genetically engineered bacteria. And uh, that would, uh, bacteria, uh, E. coli, and those would produce maybe uh, ethanol or, if we're lucky, higher alcohols because they have even less oxygen compared to hydrogen. Uh, and, um, and that would then, with hydrotreating, be uh, switched into gasoline or into uh, diesel or jet fuels. Alternatively, uh, there are, of course, ways uh, through photosynthesis to produce algae. Uh, in this case, I just show it produce um, uh, autotrophically, but of course you could produce it heterotrophically as well. I don't see much value in feeding my algae sugar in order to get it to do stuff I want. Uh, or, or cyanobacterium uh, that would uh, do this uh, autotrophically. Interestingly, uh, one of the faculty at the, uh, in my department had a pretty neat uh, process that he developed. Um, he took cyanobacterium, you know, uh, which is an uh, autotrophic uh, organism, takes sunlight, so it photosynthesizes instead of, uh, you know, consumes uh, glucose like uh, E. coli might. And um, so he used that as his, uh, as his tool. And uh, of course, taking in the sun, CO2, um, and, uh, and he found a way, by genetically modifying it, he took, um, an organism or a gene from the bacteria that they use. Uh, I think it was very close to the one that I showed you, patent number five million, one of those, and put it into the cyanobacterium. And that, in fact, allowed the cyanobacterium to, through the process of kind of like photosynthesis, produce ethanol instead of, um, you know, instead of biomass. And what he did in addition to that is, as many of you know, uh, one of the problems with ethanol fermentation is, after a while, you know that ethanol is a waste product for, for, the, for the yeast you know, when, when, when you're producing ethanol. And you can imagine what happens when you're living in your own waste. Um, at some point, you don't like it anymore. You know? you know, you're kind of swimming around in your waste. And so um, what, what we run into is what we call um, some... Uh, you know, it's inhibition. It, it, it runs into having alcohol inhibition. It's produced too much ethanol, so it's beginning to slow down its rate of, you know, its metabolic rate of, of converting it into ethanol. So it hits kind of a plateau. So what he did was he, he went and hunted for another gene from another organism, I think it was developed at NREL, uh, that would allow uh, their E. coli that they genetically modified to then get over that barrier as well. So he put that gene in. And so at the end, what he had it was a cyanobacterium, which is a autotrophic or sunlight, you know, photosynthetic type, type organism. 
as opposed to E. coli, which had to take glucose and all these other things, sugars, you had that organism producing ethanol, maybe not so happily because it wasn't naturally doing that, but it did because its new genes told them to do that. And then it also was producing uh, much in excess of what you would normally find in these organisms because it wasn't running into that ethanol inhibition. It ran into a new plateau, of course, down the road. But uh, So anyway, uh, cyanobacterium, um, they can also do the same thing, produce ethanol or higher alcohols. And of course, these could uh, either go directly into gasoline, when I say directly after you hydrotreat it, or with uh, hydrotreating again, you could produce uh, diesel fuels. I think I've got something else here somewhere. Maybe not. Oh, yeah, the two lines showing you that. Uh, just because it, the reference shows it going down like that, yeah, you can, you, you can go anywhere you want. Uh, it's just a matter of how much you're willing to pay for it. Um, this is a graphic showing you the various types of uh, biological processes that have been used to produce different types of fuels, okay? Um, and, um, and, um, and, and the different types, yeah, fuels. Uh, the end products right here. You've got ethanol, butanol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, fatty acids even. And um, the different types of organisms, I'm sorry that this is kind of hard to read, but you know, you got your Saccharomyces uh, at the top. That would be the one that uh, is used to produce ethanol from sugars. Uh, and you can see that the volumetric productivity here, two to three grams per liter per hour, <laughs> is extremely high compared to these others. Uh, these others, some of which uh, are genetically engineered, uh, are nowhere near as uh, uh, you know, efficient in terms of changing the feedstock into an end product as this uh, normal Saccharomyces found in the wild. And, and it's because, um, not surprisingly, you know, just because you can genetically modify an organism doesn't mean that organism is happy about that change. So, uh, you know, you can, you can force uh, a horse to water, I guess, and maybe you can force him to drink, but he's not going to drink happily. So, you know, it, it, um, uh, these others are, are actually very slow and uh, not very efficient in terms of their conversion of sugars into, um, in, into higher value products. Uh, okay, that's all I want. Oh, okay, then the last one, the last one, I promise, pretty much. Um, the oleochemical platform, the oil-based platform, uh, we already know about fame, uh, fatty acid methyl ester, i.e. biodiesel, okay? And then I talked about uh, hydroprocess esters and fatty acids, HIFAs, uh, that would be your know, renewable diesel. That is, in fact, a true drop in fuel, and that one comes from not only fame pipe, but you take oils and then you hydrotreat it, put a lot of work into it, okay? to get it so that you've stripped out all the oxygen, uh, pretty much changed it to hydrogen to carbon ratio of two, so you have something that looks exactly like diesel, regular diesel. And this is a comparison, in fact, here's the fossil diesel right here, okay, right in the middle. And you've got your renewable diesel, and that's the, the real surrogate. And then you have your um, biodiesel on this side, and you can see that some of the properties are, are, are quite different. And, and the most notable one is, take a look at this, the oxygen content uh, on a weight basis uh, for your renewable diesel, your surrogate uh, diesel, your drop-in fuel, the oxygen constant is zero because you hydrotreated it, pulled out all of the oxygen, um, which is the same as your uh, fossil diesel, but your um, biodiesel has a you know, oxygen concentration of 11, which you know, is rather low, but still 11% too high. Yeah? So you'll have to take that out. Um, okay. Okay, I, I just wanted to point out that, you know, in terms of uh, drop-in fuels, in fact, while I make light of how successful uh, these, um, you know, uh, fatty acids might be uh, the, the, the true drop-in biodiesel, uh, true drop-in uh, biomass-derived diesel fuel. Uh, in fact, that oleochemical platform uh, has been associated with 
most, if not all, of the commercial air flights that have been demonstrated so far, and in fact, essentially all of the commercial drop-in biofuel companies that are here of any size. Uh, for example, right here, I show you a list of every single, at least up to May 2017, uh, uh, demonstration of biofuels being used for commercial transportation, airline transportation, uh, from different operators, KLM, uh, Lufthansa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, on different jets. And um, if you take a look at these, you'll see something universally the same except for unknown. Um, all of these came from, in fact, the oleo uh, chemical platform, from the oil-based platform. None of those came from the thermal chemical platform or the biological platform. They were all done with um, oil-based uh, products, yeah? Uh, in addition to that, if you take a look at, as I said in the last slide, all of the commercial operations in terms of uh, commercial production, you'll see again that pretty much uh, all of the, you know, pretty much all of the commercial companies that are operating at any scale today are all oil-based, uh, plant oil-based, yeah? Beginning with Nesty Oil, which is the biggest one uh, and has lasted the longest, I think, uh, using palm oil as a feedstock. I don't know if they're still doing that based on what uh, Dr. Sawani said this morning. But, um, you know, the producing around 600 million gallons per year of at least nameplate. And, um, and uh, this is what it looks like. It's a fairly impressive uh, looking commercial plant. Not like my little gas fire. I mean, this is real stuff. Um, Okay, then there are a whole bunch of hybrid pathways which I'll switch. I mean, basically, you do this first, and then you switch over to that. Maybe produce a syngas, take the syngas, and then you biologically convert it. Or you uh, take, uh, you know, you, you ferment uh, cellulose, and then you take the uh, ethanol, and then you uh, thermally treat it, or something like that, and going all kind of ways. But there are a lot of ways of skinning the cat. There's uh, very few ways of making money out of it, unfortunately. Um, ah. In fact, speaking about money, uh, I did a study recently, or at least uh, looked at a study recently, or studies recently, of uh, the cost of producing biofuels. Somebody asked me about how economically feasible it was. And basically, uh, the most optimistic estimates, at least at the ones I found, uh, depending on whether you're looking at ethanol to jet fuel, butanol, all of these were jet fuel, by the way, processes. And, um, and, um, at best, you know, the, the most optimistic estimates were about uh, $3 per, um, per gallon. And I believe that those are probably very, very, very highly optimistic um, uh, estimates, yeah. Uh, most of them, uh, or many of them, projected much higher upper limits than that, above $10 a gallon. So, um, you know, we, we still have a long way to go. Although, I guess if you think that we might be able to do it for somewhere between three and five dollars a, uh, a um, gallon, then uh, you know, that's not that far. Um, think about other things. Uh, think about Moore's Law for computers. I mean, you know, efficiency improving, doubling every one and a half years. Perhaps we'll, we'll find uh, something like a Moore's Law. Yes. Um, somebody have the uh, microphone around? Thank you. Um, so my first question is from this graph. I'm looking at it and I see that uh, the cost for pyrolysis, it's relatively low compared to like very mature technology of ethanol. And pyrolysis is quite expensive as far as I know. And I was wondering how comes this low price? Okay, that's a good question. This isn't just ethanol. It's ethanol converted into jet fuel, okay? So ethanol as a, uh, you know, as a transportation fuel, not a drop-in fuel, but as a transportation fuel is cheap. Uh, I don't know, Swani, do you have any idea how much it costs to uh, manufacture ethanol from sugarcane right now? Anybody know? I think Swani fell asleep. Yeah. Uh, you, you have any idea how much it costs to produce ethanol from uh, sugarcane? Sorry, I missed you. Yeah. Um, uh, could you repeat? Um, you know how much it costs to produce ethanol from sugar cane right now? 
Uh, it's around 20 cents of dollar per liter. Okay, 20? This is 20 cents oh. of US dollars mm. per liter, the average. Okay. It goes up and down a little okay. bit, but it's sold, it sold in the pump station mm. by $1 yeah. okay. per so liter. A liter, okay, and it's sold. It's sold. It's sold. Okay. Sales price. Yeah. Sales so, price. So the production uh, cost is is much lower than than the rack price. So let's say it's about, uh, well, let's say it's fifty cents uh, per per um, per liter. That would be two dollars a gallon. Okay, that's better than you know. That's comparable to to gasoline um, production costs. So uh, ethanol is cheap to make, at least if you're making it in Brazil. Not so cheap to make maybe in the uh, United States, but to convert that ethanol into jet fuel is very expensive uh, because you have to hydro process it, etc., and that will drive the cost up. In this case, to uh, you know, as as you said, uh, anywhere from four dollars to God knows over ten dollars a gallon. Uh, pyrolysis, um, you know, I, I I think my feeling is that this is a, a fairly optimistic price. Having said that, pyrolysis will produce as an intermediate bio-oil. And bio-oil, as you saw in the last um, graphic, um, not in the, the audio chemical, but, but in the, um, uh, the earlier graphic that I showed that compared bio-oil versus crude oil, it looks not that far off from crude oil except for the oxygen content. So we know how to deal with that. Ethanol turning into jet fuel, we really, uh, you know, it's it, many steps compared to um, crude oil or bio oil converting that into jet fuel. We already know how to do that with crude oil. So it's a small step, additional step to, to deoxygenate it and, and, and then uh, convert it into jet fuel. Uh, not, not that any of this is, of course, um, uh, commercial right now. Again, the only commercial processes are the um, Oh, it doesn't even show it here. Uh, that would be the um, uh, I don't know why it's not up there, but uh, it would be the uh, audio chemical process in which I'm taking basically plant oil and converting that into um, into jet fuel. Now the big problem with that is the feedstock cost is so high. You know, oil price is so high, so that might be a Another problem. Maybe the process is simple, but if you're beginning with a feedstock cost that already might be six dollars a gallon, then you know it's hard to produce a four dollar a gallon fuel when your feedstock costs five or six bucks. Okay. You had another question? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and my other question on one of the slides, you had a very nice formula for the energy efficiency. And I was wondering what would be the energy efficiency in one of these processes, like if we take the energy content of like raw biomass to the ethanol for jet or any of these processes? Because you need a lot of steps that require a lot of energy. Oh, yeah, you, you, uh, yes, you need a lot of steps. But um, if you're talking about what kind of yield I might get, you know, that's a separate question. You can put in 10 steps, but you might get extremely good yields or you could put in 10 steps and get extremely bad yields because each one of these steps might be taking things out of the process and so on. Um, so in terms of, I don't know whether we, we, when you say what kind of efficiency you're talking about, what kind of yield I can get out of these different processes. Um, well, for example, if you put like 10 kilos of biomass and in the end you get okay. one liter right. of right. ethanol, okay. that's a low. I think it'll be in the next slide. I mm -hmm. think, I, I can't promise Thank that. Because I don't remember what I put in these things. Okay, as I said, so far uh, tests have been conducted on alcohol to jet fuel, oil to jet fuel, syngas to jet fuel, and sugar to jet fuel uh, 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 ways. And, and this oil to jet fuel, I don't see it there. Um, hmm, okay. Um, now, uh, it'll be in this next slide, by the way. So ju just as a take-home message, as a summary, oleo chemical uh, right now, uh, that pathway is commercial right now. It's less hydrogen dependent, high feedstock costs, as I said. I mean, you know, um, if you begin with a high feedstock cost, uh, no matter what you do, you're never going to produce a, a cheap uh, transportation fuel. 
uh, thermochemical, well suited for the long-term drop in biofuels, hydrogen and catalyst challenges, and I might add, I took this, uh, I removed it, but there's a scale problem with gasification. Um, most gasification systems require large scales. Uh, biochemical uh, pathway, the drop-in products are more valuable in rapidly growing chemical markets. What that means is, yes, I probably could successfully produce um, biofuels using the biochemical pathway, but there are many competing end uses for these products that, in fact, none of these might ever be used for, for you know, biofuels. And then finally, ac accessing cheap and renewable hydrogen is a key challenge for drop-in biofuels because each one of these have to be hydro-treated at the end. Yeah. Okay, I think this one has uh, what you're looking for. Ah, okay. Right here, I show you different routes. Uh, I've got here, um, yeah, right here, yield. 49 gallons per ton, okay, this is gasoline equivalent, okay? This is, by the way, a study that I, or a comparison I made fairly uh, recently for the Department of Defense, uh, the, the military in Hawaii. Uh, they wanted to know whether they could convert over to biofuels and, and uh, you know, so I, I, this is a back of the envelope type of calculation. I, I chose, however, data from just more or less one source. Now, I, I say that with some qualifiers. National Renewable Energy Lab, you'll hear a speaker from NREL on Wednesday uh, on wind farms, so it's not going to be on this. Um, but uh, NREL took a look at various pathways and did a comparison uh, of uh, how much it would cost to produce a drop-in biofuel. And I think in, um, uh, we have different types of biofuels okay, uh, in, in, in these, but it took a look at different pathways, uh, different feedstocks, et cetera, and what it would cost to produce these different drop-in biofuels using different processes. Um, and I chose this because all of these, while the original work wasn't done by NREL, NREL took a look at all the original work and then massaged all the numbers to come up with something that would make it very comparable, okay? Even the years are kind of comparable somewhere, yeah. 2010, 2013, 2015, 2015, 2014. So I didn't have to worry too much about inflation. Um, uh, and um, he, here are the yields, which I believe is what you asked. Um, so thermal gasification, I can expect to produce about 49 gallons per ton of fiber. Okay? Uh, fast pyrolysis, 89 gallons per ton of fiber. Um, uh, indirect uh, liquefaction with methanol intermediate, um, I'm looking at 65 gallons per ton. Uh, catalytic conversion of lignin cellulose uh, derived hydrolysate, and that would be 78 gallons per ton. And then fermentation of algae to lipid and carbohydrate derived fuel products, we're looking at a yield of 141 gallons per ton. And that one is largely because we are talking about an oil product to begin with as opposed to fiber or anything else. Um, having said that, you know, I'm not, if I were a company, Shell Oil, I wouldn't be in the business of making oil. I would be in the business of making money. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm in business. So, um, the, the, um, a very important thing, of course, would be the fuel price, how much you can produce it for. And this is a comparison of all of them. Uh, you can see here that in some cases, um, uh, by the way, I have minimum fuel price less the feedstock because feedstock values differed in these various uh, studies. So I wanted to see what it would look like if I took out the feedstock cost and compared all of those options and then later put in the feedstock cost and took a look at the cost of all of those options. And pretty much, well, with the, with the feedstock in it, uh, you're looking at about five bucks, uh, four bucks right here, three half. Four dollars, uh, four dollars fifty cents, you know, something like that. Uh, as I would tend to think, these are fairly optimistic uh, numbers, uh, likely to be somewhat higher, and, and and most of these would be for large uh, plants. Okay. Okay. Now, now this is finally that I, I promised earlier I, I would quit. Uh, I just wanted to put in a plug for my course. If you have a chance, come to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. 
uh, I teach two courses. Um, I believe I'm an excellent teacher. None of my students think so, but I think so. Uh, and uh, one of them is a senior engineering design, and I teach biological engineering. Yeah? So um, I'm not a very good biology person. I can talk a little bit about metabolic pathways and so on, but most of my colleagues in my department are, are very smart at what they do. I'm, I'm not. So uh, I'm a pretty good thermal person, though. Um, you know, but uh, I teach uh, senior engineering design sequence, two semesters of senior engineering design, and then I teach a course. Uh, it's a required course for our biological engineers called Biosystems uh, Unit Operations, uh, BE 437. But many of the students who take the course are, uh, of course, graduate students because they haven't had a course like this. It's typically taught to um, chemical engineers, but uh, you know, with, with much of the things these days going towards biology, uh, I try to introduce that as much as I can. And um, this is a, uh, just pretty much a snapshot off my uh, website of the different modules uh, that are in there. And it's uh, totally illegible, but I can uh, kind of take a look at the, uh, I, ca I can see the pictures so I know what they are. All right, this one would be an introduction right there. Uh, this would be the program that we use, ChemCAD, uh, some of you who might be chemical engineers uh, use Aspen perhaps. Uh, these are process engineering simulators that allow you to do all kind of fancy stuff, you know, uh, on paper, not, not in real life, of course. That would be frightening. Uh, heating and evaporation is the next one. And then um, looks like, uh, I don't know what that looks like. No, I think heating, uh, yeah, heat and evaporation. This one, uh, I can't tell. This one would be drying. Uh, this one would be centrifugation. Uh, this one would be uh, filtration. And then, um, uh, not sure about that one. Distillation. Um, and then, uh, not too sure about this one. Uh, or this one, uh, I've got membrane separation there somewhere, and, uh, and then, oh, this would be a, uh, basically a batch operation for biological systems, so fermentation, et cetera, et cetera, you know, so mostly the um, biochemical side, and then finally on this side is the thermal operations, so this would be combustion, gasification, all of these things. Uh, it's, a, it's a great course, you know, and, and at the end, the students all have to do a course project, uh, most of it just simulations, of course, but, but it's worth only 20% of the grade, but they all try to work on it very hard. I, uh, uh, by the way, it's an excellent uh, course in my mind because it, it actually takes a look at various unit operations in real systems. For example, if you were doing sugarcane uh, milling and then um, you know, producing sucrose as well as producing ethanol, um, if you take a look at um, my course, the headings were all of those that are flashing up there, you know, pretty much. Uh, milling, uh, heating, clarification, uh, filtration, uh, cooking, which is evaporation, drying, um, well, evaporation there as well, and, um, and then centrifugation and fermentation, uh, distillation, dehydration, all of those are, are taught as different uh, unit operations. So you can apply this to almost any uh, bioprocess or, you know, or chemical uh, engineering process. Uh, just uh, to give you another insight on this, uh, these are the projects I give the students. Uh, these are fairly easy projects that they can do. It's only worth 20% of their grade, but they uh, struggle on it a little bit, and, and they can work on teams of two. You know? So um, although these are quite uh, varied, Almost all of them deal with bioenergy in some sense. They're the ones with the asterisk in them. So example, uh, power generation from digested animal waste, fermentation and concentration of ethanol from sugar, thermal gasification of biomass into medium BTU gas with air separation, uh, drying and combustion of biomass for cogeneration, um, and then uh, separation, I talked about this earlier, separation of power and non-power fraction in solar insulation using power fraction to produce microalgae and non-power fraction for PV power. Uh, production of hydrogen from bio-oil using calcium oxide as a CO2 sorbent. That's, of course, a project I did, so I'm sneaking this in and making them do that. Uh, and production of beer. Uh, I don't know if that qualifies as uh, you know, 
bioenergy, but I, I certainly like to drink beer, so I, I put it in there. Okay, with that, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that I kept most of you awake. And once again... I'm afraid of her question, so. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I have just a quick question. Uh, we are talking a lot about uh, jet fuels, yeah. and I was wondering if there were any flights running only on uh, bio jet fuels, 100%, yeah, 100%. 100%, yeah. Okay, yeah, great, them. thank you. Thank you, that was an easy one. Hello. Um, it's not my uh, my area of actuation, but um, neither mine. <laughs> uh, but I I, I'm, I have this curiosity about see in down south of Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul, we do have this project from Sul Gas, which is I believe that Congas do have something similar that is um, produce GNV for from um, uh, natural gas for vehicles to gas to blend from for oh. transportation. Okay. So yeah. uh, uh, it's it's more an, an open question. Maybe, maybe you, since you, professor, she knows uh, the she answer. Knows the, the, she the, knows the answer. answer. Yeah. Well, I'm not the sure lecture. the answer. Uh, uh, <laughs> how 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 the for instance in Brazil, they are at least at, at least a thing that I know they are trying to to obtain some kind of permission from ANP, which is our national agency for uh -huh. petroleum, to blend it in the natural gas, uh, the, their pipes that they have there. So I'm, I'm not very sure that if they have the, 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 this, this question, this. I can answer you. I and, and purification. Yes, but uh, the, the issue is the following. Uh, First, uh, finally, the regulatory agency for petroleum gas, they uh, allowed the injection of biomethane produced from biogas, the upgrade of biogas into the natural gas grid. Uh, and more recently, this year, they finally agreed any kind of biomethane, it doesn't matter the origin, because in last year, they did not allow if biomethane came from landfills or sewage, street, uh, sewage treatment stations because of contaminants. So uh, now they realize that we can clean it and so it's allowed. But uh, mainly in most states it's allowed, but it's not mandatory. So uh, the state of Sao Paulo is trying to push for that and the state of Sao Paulo is trying to uh, make it mandatory a small blend of biomethane into natural gas grid, like 0.5% of biomethane into natural gas grid. But this is still under discussion. Okay, did I answer you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's very specific from Brazil. <laughs> <laughs>